My name is Christian Krieger. I am working for the Jordan Research Center of the European Commission. Um, I'm working there in a unit that's actually dedicated to connecting the scientific community with the policymaking community. So we are uh, embodying this concept of knowledge brokerage um, in our unit, but also more widely um, for, the, for the JRC. Um, I can say that. Uh, so today uh, we are uh, one of the four sessions that looks into capacity building in support of evidence from policymaking. Um, others are looking at early career researchers uh, and, for instance, the public administration and how to build capacity there. But we are actually looking at the most interesting bit. Um, so, so I thought at least, uh, I know that you are all interested, so I, I appreciate that um, um, because any sort of endeavors to connect uh, the two communities we are talking about uh, requires intermediary actors and for that we need specific skills. So I have prepared um, two or three slides of our understanding of of knowledge brokerage um, from the JSC side. Uh, let me just share them and then you'll also get an idea of, let's say, the original plan of our um, session. But given the, the relatively low attendance, I would suggest that we keep uh, this as a more sort of plenary style session. Um, we had initially given the registrations foreseen uh, um, breakout rooms, but I think we can uh, we can have enjoy and benefit from this more intimate setting and um, and and uh, remain in the uh, in the plenary mode. Let me just quickly share my slide. Uh, I'll be very quick because the the actual more interesting material will be coming, of course, from Gün. Yes, um, also a practitioner and science for policy. Um, let me just, I'm not sure. Yes. Um, so as I said, we are talking about how to train the next generation, even of knowledge brokers. Um, uh, and the idea is for me to kick off. Um, then we have 10, 15 minutes of Gün talking about her experience at the uh, Baltic Sea Center as knowledge brokerage. Uh, and then we go straight into plenary discussions. Um, uh, we can probably, given the number of participants, start the tour de table and discuss your own experience uh, and your own relation to knowledge brokerage organizations. But um, just a few remarks from the JSC's perspective. What are knowledge brokers? Why we find them important? And why we may need uh, unique competencies. Um, what are knowledge brokers? So we have a quite a wide um, functional definition. So they can perform a wide variety of tasks. Uh, so on the one hand, they're more conventional sort of dissemination, translation, synthesis, and communication of research for policy, and to um, the sort of the supply side driven side and then demand side driven side is the management of requests for, for evidence and the facilitation of access to evidence. Um, a more sort of exotic uh, roles involve training of scientists and policymakers in um, how to better work with each other, building platforms and partnerships, again, for, for the two communities to interact more effectively, uh, tasks such as rewarding policy impact and uh, even creating processes and posts uh, for science for policy. So these are all um, tasks that we, uh, we would hope and <laughs> we would promote in, in knowledge brokerage organizations. Um, we don't uh, sort of attribute, also we don't identify really a location for knowledge workers because they can, they can be close to the government, but they can also be sort of embedded in the scientific community. They can be more floating in between. Um, in all these sort of locations, we need um, some form of um, these activities and functions I just described above. Um, why they are important for us. I mean, it's also a bit of maybe uh, legitimizing the JRC's role itself, but 
we see science for policy as a collective task. Um, so um, it, it requires an entire ecosystem actually to deliver uh, science effectively to, to the policymakers. And here, as I already said, knowledge brokers play a critical role in, in sort of performing these functions to connect the elements of such an ecosystem. Um, and then we also feel that the intermediary organizations are very important because research performing organizations and policy making entities actually have complete other priorities and limited resources. So some kind of intermediary organization to support this are very important. And finally, uh, before handing over to Gün, um, in terms of unique competences, I mean, the JRC has actually developed two competence frameworks, one for scientists, one for policymakers and self-assessment tools as well. If you want to know how well you can uh, sort of perform policy engagement with scientists, you can take a, an online self-assessment tool um, where we already identified different clusters of competencies. Um, so for scientists to, to understand and participate in policy making, how to communicate and collaborate uh, with different stakeholders and uh, between different disciplines and also the engagement with stakeholders, obviously, and for policymakers working with evidence, meaning understanding models, being science literate, uh, being futures literate, and also to understand uh, collaboration uh, across government, but also with, with scientists. So we have already identified some clusters. I mean, the, the, the actual competence frameworks are a little bit more detailed and complex. But we have already identified um, um, key clusters that will help uh, evidence from policy making. But the question is, are there additional specific uh, competencies uh, that the knowledge brokers need to develop uh, or, yeah, or focus on? So this is a question we haven't answered and we are hoping that today's uh, session will, will maybe help us um, understand this better, what might be needed. Uh, so this was a, a very brief, hopefully, introduction, and I see we are, our numbers are increasing, so that's fantastic, but we can probably still remain in, in the plenary and, and not go into uh, breakout rooms later. But with this, I wanted to, to, to hand over to Gün, who can tell you a lot more about how she and they are doing it. Gün, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian. Uh... And thanks a lot for having me and organizing this really interesting event. And I thought the morning was really interesting as well. And I think that the, that gave us a lot of thoughts that we can still discuss during this session. Um, a few words about myself before I share my presentation. Uh, I work at the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center as a policy analyst. I'm head of policy. And I will be trying to give you a few examples of how the university has chosen to work to try to bridge the gap between science and policy. And we could be one example, and uh, we could give you a few things to think about and discuss at this session. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Let's see if it, if it just comes with me. So now, can you see it? Yeah, we can see yeah, it. Great, wonderful. All right, so um, I'll, I'll very briefly, 10 minutes or so, maybe 15, talk a bit about um, the role of a few things that we've found were key to having a success as knowledge brokers, really, and, you know, minishing this, this gap. And it's the role of statutes and organization, the role of staff with different skills, and the role of using different working methods, that, that there's not a one single method that fits all purposes. And then touching upon the role of funding and time, of course. And then finally, uh, getting back again to training and education. And this will be very brief, of course, but I'm happy to take all questions or get in touch afterwards. So please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. I'll have to start with saying just a few words about the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center. This is a view of Stockholm University. And uh, to your right, unless you're the bar of all of us speaking here is in your way, which is for me, so I have to move us a bit. You can see that we actually have a three-dimensional function as a center. Um, we do a lot of research, of course. It's all focused on the Baltic Sea and the environmental status of the Baltic Sea. And we run a huge field station 
But the third circle is actually what we're talking about here today. It's about policy, policy analysis, and communication. But I'll be keep getting back to the fact that all the, these different ways of working and collaborating together, they are actually key. And it has also been key for us to realize that we actually have statutes with operational objectives that gives us the mandate. It's really strongly pinpointed from this, even from the center of the university, from you know the chancellor's level, that uh, we have this task of trying to develop working methods. We have the support, we have the money, and we have the objectives of what we are supposed to achieve. And I think without that, this would have been very, very difficult because now we can actually go to the researchers and talk to them. And the few researchers that are actually employed at the center, they even have this within their workday. They are obliged to do more communication work than a general researcher. So this picture really illustrates what I think about this. You know, it's about, you know, holding hands, bridging, getting together, and maybe function in the middle there as the catalyst. We heard a lot about this this morning, being that intermediary person, they, they called us hybrid persons, you know, you know about the policy structures, you understand what's happening when the US EU Commission sends out a communication, what is that in relation to other ongoing processes, etc. But you're also familiar with the scientific world, and how does that operate? So I think this this of functioning in between there and being able to talk to both of these categories, that's actually key. So I think that knowledge brokers are definitely a, a part of the solution. And it may sound as if I'm really sort of, you know, just talking in favor of our own work. But uh, our understanding is that you need people who have that pretty broad scientific knowledge. It's very difficult to be a knowledge broker unless you know your scientific field. But on the other hand, you also have to know and be in depth about the policy structures because otherwise you miss the opportunity or you talk to the wrong person at the wrong time. And when we work with this, it's more or less the same as working with any other project. We do project planning. That's nothing new in that really. And where these policy analysts fit in is about these really hands-on things. It's about keeping track of policy processes. You know, no researcher, you know, from my experience, neither have the time nor the capacity to, you know, have the ear to the ground and follow the policy process in depth. Meaning that, you know, checking with the commission when the first communication is coming out, you know, talking to the rapporteurs in the parliament, etc either on EU level or on national level. And I think that also policy analysts need to understand the science needs. You know, what can science really answer? and Where, where is it possible for science to step in? So it's, it's obvious you need to be a networker. You need to have social skills to talk to people. And you need to have what I think many people uh, commented on this morning, you know, big ears and be a listener also, and create these dialogues. And you have to be able to look at your context. You know, what kind of strategy should I choose for this context? What is happening right now? Where is it appropriate and right for the scientific community to step in? And make sure that the scientists are very comfortable when they engage in discussions and see their role and not sort of mix it with maybe you know, being lobbyists, etc. because we're not coming with that. We're coming with the scientific knowledge, creating the base for, for a better discussion. And I'll get back to what we could do. You know, it could be about answering consultations and train scientists and teach students, but I'll get back to that. You know, when you communicate science, all of you who maybe work with communication, you always answer these questions. Why, what is the message? For whom am I doing this? When and how? And we do it, you know, really formally as forming a project because that may gives it the possibility of being clear for everybody participating. And then it creates that 
getting together, we decide on who is supposed to be within this project, what are time spans, when are we doing what, and you need to involve both communicators, the scientists, and us with more knowledge about the policy processes. So this, is, uh, this isn't anything different from any other project plan. Um, from our perspective, we think about two different starting points when we engage in policy. You know, either there is really already an ongoing policy process or a public debate that needs a scientific knowledge to be out there and taken into consideration. Or the other way around, we know that all of a sudden there is scientific findings that should lead to a political action. And of course, these two different starting points will decide what method is the most fruitful. So what we would do, you know, this could be examples of outreach work. We do a lot of policy briefs because we find the synthesis work of trying to boil down huge amounts of scientific knowledge into a full page policy brief is extremely useful because that forces all of us to decide on what is possible to say. And it's always the scientist who decides on the message. It could be one, two, 10, 15 scientists maybe, but it has to be based within the scientists. And then we as policy analysts, we can help out with putting it in the right frame and context. And we try within these policy briefs to also include really clear policy recommendations, as clear as possible. You know, sometimes you hear a researcher say, let's put in, let's work for sustainable development. And we go, mm -mm, that's not a policy recommendation. You need to boil it down to come as close as what we're actually talking about as possible, as close to that as the scientist feels comfortable to of doing. And then, of course, you need scientists from different uh, fields of knowledge. Uh, we also organize lots of uh, personal meetings and short seminars. Uh, in your upper right corner, there's a researcher from Baltic Sea Center taking part of a hearing in the European Parliament on fisheries, for instance, as an example. And the larger picture there is uh, four researchers in the middle uh, where we had a hearing about a national commission talking about in front of the, of the next upcoming national election. We also answer lots of consultations, both on the, at the European level, but also at national level. And one reason for doing that is to agree on policy statements, because through that policy process of answering a consultation, you make sure that the researchers come together from different fields and formulate their opinions. And it's extremely useful then later on to have that answer because the communicators or us, we can be out there and we know what the researchers think about this issue. Then it's easy to talk about it. And of course, then on top of that, a lot of media work. You know, you can write articles, you can um, make sure that you talk to journalists and make sure that they come to your events, etc. And we talk to all kinds of actors. I mean, national governments, the industry, the NGO sectors, uh, the European level, anybody who's out there wanting to hear our views. I think that there are a few key words. You have to work in a really long-term perspective. And we've learned that we have to be really persistent. My experience is that it takes about 10 years to shift the policy process, really. And that maybe it's in contradiction to the next word where I've written fast, but that's also key because we are often approached by civil servants at the national level who say, for instance, oh, tomorrow my, my boss is coming up and he or she has to speak in the parliament on this topic. Where, where is this latest knowledge? What can you give us? And then you have to react, I mean, within half a day. So it's it's both really being there, being a supportive desk, maybe a hub for knowledge and fast assistance, but also continuously working on the long-term processes. So very often we find ourselves really repackaging or reinventing things. I mean, the message is very often long-term and the same, but now all of a sudden this group wants it to be packed at a green package and this other group needs a red package. So it's a lot of repatching and reformulating your message. 
Um, we also work within our own university structure and we formalize that by, for instance, trying to um, offer the researchers uh, regular meetings. Uh, for instance, we have researchers who all work with eutrophication issues and we invite them every other four weeks or six weeks to a meeting where they share the latest on the scientific perspective and we share what's going on. And then we talk about what, what shall we do? What can we do? How can we work with this together? And those sort of regular meetings, they increase the knowledge on both sides, really. So they've helped us a lot, I think, in being really, really quite formal in how often we meet and how we meet and what's the purpose of this meeting. And then we also have media training for researchers. You know, we have a journalist working here and they do media training. How do you talk to journalists? How do you get your message across? Uh, what should you say, etc.? And that's been very useful. And then also we try to work directly with the students, both at the master's and PhD level. And as a part of a number of different uh, courses that they have to take, both the compulsory ones and also voluntary ones, we have large chunks of societal issues, uh, policy science, different topics, where we actually just have you know workshops and teach them and do that. And they've been very popular so far, at least. So then, of course, you ask yourself, is this a youth successful method? Can this be used? So I'll put in here just three examples of the scientific studies where they've looked at knowledge brokers. So I put them here. So if you would, would like to look at them afterwards, very um, clear and very common in all these three was one thing really was that the four most important features for having an impact on policy and practice was actually clear goals, a very clear leadership that gave you again the mandate, and of course funding. Funding is key, you have to have money and time to do this. And then finally, what I've, what I've actually talked about all the time, having also policy analysts on board. They can't do the jobs themselves, of course, but being that third party within communicators and scientists. And I think it is important that this trilogue of people also exist at universities and not only at, at other bodies outside the universities. I think it's essential that the universities also work with this. So thank you for listening. And I hope I'm giving you a few, few ideas that we can continue and talking about. And as I said, please get in touch if you want to hear more about how we work. Thanks. I'm sure this was really an inspiring example. And you also thankfully highlight what's required for a good work. Um, leadership, resources, goals, and obviously the staff to do it. So this is already mostly right. Uh, so, so, sorry, Christian, your sound is really poor now. Maybe is it just, I don't know, is it only me or? Um, what do you, is, the, is the sound done? The sound okay. Um, okay, sorry. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. I, um, um, now it's better. Maybe it was just your angle. It? Okay, sorry. I think, does it work? Well, okay. I have, I'm fortunate enough not to sit all by my own in, in, a, in a room, but Marina, uh, uh, responsible tech support, she's here to, to intervene. Okay, I think it works. Yes, perfect. Um, so as I said, we are we are nineteen all together. Um, so I would suggest we we stay in this room, and I would kindly like to ask that you switch on your cameras if you want to actively participate uh, to make it a little bit more relatable. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, I mean there there are, there are a number of questions we set out when we designed um, this session, which is what skills are needed, who should be doing training, and sort of different professional pathways towards knowledge brokerage. But I think based maybe on Vuin's presentation, we can sort of broaden the discussion a little bit 
to to think more widely about knowledge brokerage and the prerequisites for that. One of them being obviously to getting the, the right staff, but, but to keep the discussion a little bit broader. Uh, and maybe one way to go about this is um, if we do a small tour de table, we can afford this, we have time and we have a limited number of people. Um, and uh, maybe you can, if you have questions to Gun, you can you can you can uh, direct them at her directly, um, but also to describe your own connection to the to the to the topic and your interest in the topic of knowledge brokerage, and um, then uh, to th think maybe about the prerequisites for effective knowledge brokerage as far as you know it and understand it, and um, how this can be supported, who should be supporting that, and how. Um, and I see there are four, five, six people that have switched on the camera. So I will um, I will start with them, and I will then I will be impolitely um, trying to wake up those that are not visible. And on my top left is Jaga Schreiber from Delft University. Jaga, do you want to maybe open the show a bit? Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. My name is Jaga Schreiber. I am an international uh, advisor and research funding advisor at uh, TU Delft Innovation and Impact Center. I am uh, interested uh, in uh, science for policy to make um, bigger impact with the research that our uh, researchers are doing. So I try to position results of TU Delft um, that are relevant for the policymakers, and I'm looking here yeah, for trainings and and for way how we can sort of uh, yeah basically improve our activities within university and also how can we leverage uh, what researchers are already doing um, and how can we also synergize across university universities offer extremely big <laughs> so there are different departments people are doing dif different yet similar things so how can we yeah, combine and, and synergize. Yeah, so I think I will stop here. Very good. Now that that's indeed uh, we are in the right place, and I'm sure that Gun can also talk a bit later on after we complete the round about how she connects to other parts of the university. Um, just to to give an idea about the synergy question, and then also in terms of training that we, we I think Gun and I can probably also give some ideas, but I hope that the others will also be able to have. Uh, the next on my screen is Tanya Tumba. Sorry if I butcher any names. No, sounds good. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I have been a professor in technology and have transitioned for the past four months to a technology policy fellowship to learn and to pivot my career somehow closer. So we have an interdisciplinary team where we have a political scientist, we have a whole computer science department, and then we have these people who are translating and I'm an information system scholar. So I'm supposed to be interested in the use of technology. Uh, so I'm sitting in between and trying to understand how could I evolve this type of a project into more than the fellowship and meet people who do similar things uh, basically. Very good. I think that will also, I mean, the role of technology might be something that could also be included in our discussion of how this can support knowledge um, uh, brokerage. And then obviously the interdisciplinarity of the team is also quite important, I, I believe. Uh, so let's move to Barbara Schmidt. I think we met before. But... Yes. Hi, Hello. <laughs> Hi, hey, Christiane. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Barbara Schmidt Abbey, and I uh, recently transitioned from working for a European Union um, agency, uh, Eurofound, um, uh, and I was involved in the EU ANSA network of uh, EU agencies science providing network. Um, uh, so I was involved in, in that. And now I, I am transitioned to being a full time um, PhD researcher. And I'm interested in the question of uh, the role of boundary organizations at the science policy interface. And so this is probably the angle I'm particularly interested in um, uh, related to knowledge brokerage. So what is the role of these specific boundary organizations such as EU agencies and other specific organizations set up to provide a policy relevant knowledge and um, scientific advice? 
and uh, and and also in a way my, my personal interest is also how to how can we overcome a potentially binary framing of this science to policy interface I mean, how can we actually overcome this towards more this ecosystem idea and get getting from this bridging from one place to another and the two communities to, uh, uh, setting how to, can we actually uh, go move beyond that so so that would be my interest thank you very good thanks Dr. Barbara. And is your PhD about this, or is the is is uh, is this sort of just a personal interest? No, that's my PhD. So oh. that my PhD okay. interest. So very interested about this conference and what it what it brings. Thank you. Great. Okay, Gloria Fuentes, please. The floor is yours. Hello. Um, basically, my interest comes because uh, I transitioned from being a researcher for many years to be a scientific visual communicator this is how i called myself because uh, basically i really see very clearly the misalignment that someone mentioned between science and policy makers and society so i am a bit curious about this role of uh, knowledge brokers because i see very often that there are many people like me highly trained in science that the system cannot keep um, embedding in, in the academia, but that is like, we could be doing things that help science and they're still related with science. So I really feel that we are kind of wasting all these highly trained people. We are not giving options, but it's like, we don't know how to get the training that is missing because obviously I am kind of an old person. So it's like, I didn't have in my curriculum any kind of illustrations that I am doing now, I learned by myself, animations, how to communicate, and much less about policy uh, kind of analysis or whatever it is needed. So it's like, I think we need to push for this kind of training, this kind of generating this um, expertise in people that they are highly trained already, rather than trying to get people from outside the science arena and educating them in science. So it's like, uh, I am really interested to see like, how can we advocate for these people already in the system, but outside the academia, that they want to keep doing things for science? How do, how do we go and get this training that is missing in our curriculum? Very good. Thanks, thanks a lot. Indeed, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, again, I'm curious how Stockholm University does this, where the policy analysts are coming from, but we come to that a bit later. <laughs> Let me, Profi, sorry, again, for, if I do anything to your name, you don't it, like. It's a hard one. It's an Irish one. Um, it's Maura, Maura Brophy. Um, yeah, no, I know it looks nothing like it. So I have a kind of... Um, I suppose a long history, my, my own academic background is in politics and political theory, but since then I've worked in almost every discipline. I'm a hardcore generalist, like I can understand most disciplines pretty quickly or fake it, I don't know. Um, but I've worked across all of them and I've oh, it has always struck me, you know, the evidence to policy gap and how we don't have good mechanisms for bringing those, especially things that are not commercial, you know, like we've, we've kind of got a pretty advanced commercial pipeline but things that would benefit society maybe outside commercial not so much um so i took an interesting turn uh, a year ago and i joined an ngo called center for effective services which works right in the gap right i guess they are a knowledge broker right at the boundary um it's a small organization actually chuck feeney who died yesterday would have funded it originally through atlantic philanthropy so it's not government funded it's funded through a philanthropic fund um and the work is done primarily with government departments and the community and voluntary sector. And we work primarily in public services. So healthcare, education, um, you know, uh, justice, youth justice, equality, those are the areas. And we work directly with the departments. But our staff are, I guess, what you would call scientists, we, I would call researchers, primarily social scientists, some social workers who, you know, people who've bridged from implementation into research and research into implementation, to understand methodologies and can apply them, but respond directly to departments' requests for information on the short timeframes, things that aren't maybe 
interesting to maybe academic researchers because it's not really about discovery. They're about taking what's best and what we know and applying it. Um, so we do a lot of that and it's really, really interesting. However, we don't have a formal place in the system. There isn't the ecosystem developed there. And we're while we're practically doing this thing that everyone talks about that's so needed, there's no funding for it. There's no legitimacy for it. There's no... So I'm, I suppose I'm here with all those gazillion questions that I've just thrown out there that have been rolling around in my head for the past 20 years of my career. And I'm, I'm finding this an incredibly interesting conference, um, you know. Well. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, in, indeed, I, I find it interesting to hear that many of you have just been transitioning to new roles uh, um, and, and towards more sort of policy engagement um, and, and how it has become a thing apparently. So very good. Um, I have two more um, that that uh, two more guests that that have switched on the camera. Maru, ah, I will just switch off the camera. So let's go with uh, Ornella, Ornella first. On the body, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly well. It works from our side. Okay, uh, sorry. No, <laughs> um, no. So uh, after I finished my PhD, I decided to move to uh, policy advice. Um, I was a scientific advisor for some time until I decided to change uh, again career. So uh, Moira, you're not the only one trying all the different fields out there. <laughs> Um, I actually really um, enjoyed um, th that part, the science diplomacy part, and I came across uh, science diplomacy through Marie Sladowska Reaction and the MCAA um, as a, a, a alumni uh, that I was. And uh, MCAA is actually very much involved now. It's more than they used to to be before, um, uh, but. As I, I am also like a, a little bit of generalist myself and trying to um, uh, see, uh, I, I'm an engineer by profession, but uh, I apply the engineering aspect, the technology into healthcare. So for me, it was, and it, it is still very important to see the healthcare system from different stakeholders perspective. And uh, I, I think we need more people like this who like, have seen have touched up like all different aspects of it and maybe give like i don't know like uh, proper advice or uh, be um the brokers between different like uh, filling the gaps between the, these different uh, stakeholders uh, but i think uh, so far i've seen very few um, institutions or like uh, need for this kind of people or at least mm -hmm. um that's my knowledge so far. Let's, let's, let's hope we can we can sort of mobilize further knowledge. But it's good that you bring in MCAA because I think they are at least organizing many events um, that involve sort of people having transitioned from research into policy making. Um, I, I know from a colleague Lorenzo that he has done that uh, from the hard science course more science policy. Um, <clears throat> MCA is the Marie Curie uh, Alumni Association from yes. or Action. Yeah, okay, just to good. And finally, uh, Maru, um, if you want to also tell your story. Um, well, actually, it's 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 very simple. I started off my career as a scientist doing very basic science, so miles away from any policy. Or practical application. Um, but a few years ago, I developed a second career within academia in uh, ethics and, and social sciences, and particularly became very interested in the science policy interface. Um, so I've been doing that for the last four, three, four years. And um, now I'm in uh, the process with a colleague of mine. We're trying to set up a knowledge brokerage organization, um, particularly with a focus on embedding um, uh, 
diversity, inclusion, and, and pluralism in the brokerage, uh, in the brokerage work. Uh, one thing that I, I find is um, quite common in what I've seen in, in this space is always to rely on the in the same usual suspects, either because they have the communication skills or because they have, you know, the contacts, the social capital. And uh, for me, one of the key um, questions is how, how can we move um, from this sort of close network where you always have the same people interacting with the same policymakers and, and widen the circle. So diversity, basically. Very, very important question. Um... So uh, I will conclude this, this round. Ah, I see that Nilayi Rudu also wants to take the floor. Hello. Yes, Hello. thank you. Please accept mm -hmm. my apologies for keeping the camera off. Uh, no this problem. is Nilay uh, from Turkey, and mm -hmm. I'm currently working as a, a remote consultant for UNESCO. I'm a hydrologist, uh, but I have an engineering background, civil engineer. And I did a master's in flood risk management. It was an Erasmus Mundus master's degree. So uh, we had lots of interdisciplinarity in our focus. And we were promoted as futures professionals, flood risk professionals have, who would have a wide perspective on issues concerning floods. Then I did a PhD artificial intelligence, water resources. Um, during my PhD, I worked uh, in an EU-funded project, um, EU FP7 project, research project. At the same time, after that, I also worked as a consultant, as an engineer for, for water-related projects on water. Uh, drought risk management, for example. And then um, another experience, I found myself in the United Nations. I was in the World Meteorological Organization. And all these experiences got me thinking, well, I'm a researcher by heart, but I've seen how the government approaches to research and how the uptake of their research. And then I saw the inter intergovernmental organization um, trying to enhance the practice component. And at the moment, I'm trying, I'm struggling in finding the optimum outlets, like the positions that would enable me to contribute in a way to enhance the science policy practice nexus. I know that this conference is speci especially dedicated to policy, but I'm a very big uh, fan of the practice component as well, the services, like as in climate services. And so um, having the opportunity to meet with like-minded people and um, hearing that we have common perspectives and concerns is just uh, a, a gift. So very thanks, so many thanks for creating this platform. Um, my question, overall question, is about the funding. I think all it's everything comes to the funding. Nobody is. I, I refer to organizations, the institutions, the universities, uh, the governments. When it comes to funding, to to uh, enable knowledge brokers to contribute in their best way, um, there is no fitting positions advertised. The current employment structure usually uh, welcomes the traditional, well-defined, uh, like the, uh, in terms of boundaries, uh, positions and not supporting interdisciplinarity and alternative career paths. Uh, I, I think uh, most of you are familiar with these alternative career paths. 
And apologies for attempting to connect with all of you over LinkedIn, but uh, I'm just extremely happy. And I would love to hear your opinions on how to improve the funding to enable knowledge brokers, aside from those in working uh, institutions like uh, the Baltic Sea Organization. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Milai. Um, it, it's good that you joined uh, because uh, even though we are talking a lot about science for policy, the, the, the sort of interface problems between science and practice is obviously similar. Um, so, um, and uh, maybe as a maybe word of hope and to trigger some optimism, um, I mean, I think uh, in previous Horizon funding and framework program funding, um, there was nothing on science communication and nothing, nothing, very little on knowledge transfer, for instance. And this has been gradually added as an important component. And I think in the upcoming um, framework negotiations, there will be, uh, because the policy shift at the EU, the EU level, there will certainly also be reflections on how to make policy make science more relevant for policies and also to ask for this in in in, in future uh, proposals uh, that's at least the the, the hope um, that uh, this will make its way into to the horizon program um so i think there were many 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 different questions and some of them i hope that Gun can um, lead on so i have noted down how to work for instance, across different uh, parts of the university, um, how to ensure it's not always the same people that uh, can talk to policymakers, how to help scientists to become policy analysts or discover uh, this is, is sort of a different role, new opportunities. Uh, and uh, and then there were some wider questions that we can maybe address later. But uh, maybe you can you can talk a bit uh, about the funding, about cross university contacts, connections, and about careers in policy analysis for scientists and where hmm. your policy analysts are coming from. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Uh, I'll be happy to. Let me start with what came up uh, when you and I talked about funding. Um, something that we talk a about, lot about is the way that research councils when they set up the funding for the research projects. You know, throughout the last maybe 10, 15 years, there's been a shift. So you at least within your project have time to sort of synthesize the results at the end, you know, in a policy brief or in some other sort of smaller format after all your scientific articles have been published, et cetera. But I think it is would be very, very nice if also the research councils could add a bit of money for the researchers to actually do something with this synthesis of knowledge. Because from our perspective, that's when the real work begins in bridging the gap between science and policy. Because you cannot by no means ask a policymaker to look at this scientific article. I mean, they, they don't even understand what's in there. So you need to help that, that uh, policymaker. So I think that's one of the key things, you know, you need, as somebody was saying, time and money for the researchers to actually go along to meetings with you, even maybe sometimes travel to Brussels, et cetera. Who's gonna fund that? So I think step one would be for the research councils to add a bit of time for the researchers to do something with their results. You know, not only putting it on the web and then say, okay, over and done with, I'll go for the next project. Because I think you put the researchers in an impossible situation. I said somebody in the morning said, you know, publish or perish. That's the, the, the situation today. So I think that is, you know, one of the real bottlenecks for doing this work, that there isn't really any money around for having people and all researchers to do this. And we've also learned, I think, through the years that it's been helpful for us to work really, really closely and be within the, the same organizations as the researchers. Because I hear sometimes um, examples where knowledge brokers are sort of put within a certain group somewhere, uh, you know, at the top of the university or something. 
and it doesn't really work, is our experience. You need to be sort of at the same coffee table, meeting each other in the corridors, having those little chats. So you get to know each other and you can work together, really. And then you can work with the researchers who are interested. And then, of course, there are some researchers who would prefer, no, please leave me, you know, at my desk or in my lab. That's fine, you know. You can start working with the ones who would like to be out there talking to not to um, to other groups of the society. Um, you have to help me here, Christine. Now I'll, I'll go to the Thank next you. question that was in my head at least. I'm probably losing a lot of them, but um, you you said, Christian, you know, how do we get to um, talk to other parts of the university? Mm -hmm. um, well, we've learned throughout the years that you need to be the one you know, knocking on their doors saying, hi, this this department of this and that, can we please come and introduce ourselves and talk to you and show you how we can help you with dif different aspects. Uh, you know, ask them for 50 minutes on their monthly meeting or things like that, really, you know, approaching them with your, uh, with your offer of trying to support them either by learning them about policy processes or, Inv inviting them to brown bag lunches about now we're going to explain the upcoming EU election, what is it all about, you know, etc. You know, things like that. Really hands on, tasty, juicy suggestions for uh, brown bag lunches or presentations. So we do a lot of that, just knocking on doors and uh, getting in touch with, for instance, um, uh, researchers who are in charge of different educational parts. Could be uh, compulsory parts for PhD courses, you know, can we please add on the science policy perspective within the within your course courses? And I think that's been useful. And I think that most of the time we're extremely welcome. I mean, people say, yes, please, this is wonderful. I have no time for by, by myself for this, but please, can you help us? Then it's great. So I haven't really experienced that people say, no, I don't want to do this. It's more like, yeah, it's great that somebody has time and money to do this, and we'll be happy to help you with the, you know, the right knowledge. But if you can then, you know, set up the meeting and fix this and get learn, teach me how, who should I talk to when, etc. So it's been a very open-minded setup, I think. And I had one more question, but this is very interesting. That I mean, you, what you mentioned also about the leadership and the support. I mean, you must have had a lot of support from the from the university leadership to set this up. No, I mean yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, this this whole setup of the Baltic Sea Center as a trial and error group really yeah, yeah. came about from the really top level of the university, saying we have to make to sort of this third task of the universities that we talk about in Sweden. You know, research, education, and then outreach work. They wanted to take that to the next level. So they had, uh, they, they put up a commission trying to set up, you know, what, how should we do this? And after that, they gave that task to the Baltic Sea Center and, you know, now you have to help us. So we got it because Stockholm University is really strong in marine research. So then we focus on, you know, trying to put this into practice using the marine area as one of the topics really. Yeah, it's very, very, very interesting case indeed. And then finally, I mean, we had a few, many of, of those that spoke were talking about their transition from a hard research role to, to, to becoming more sort of science policy uh, intermediary. Um, your staff that's working um, on as policy analysts, where do they come from? What are their mm -hmm. backgrounds? We're very few. I mean, there are a number of communicators and they have a mixed background. They all have more or less marine biology background, but on top of that, they're either journalists or communicators. And then we are three people at the policy side and we have a very mixed background. We're not three full-time, but at least three people. One has a background in national macroeconomics, but has been working for a long time within the political structure, even at EU level and also at really top ministerial state secretary level. And then the third person also has some marine biology background, but has been working within the commission and within the NGO sector and within the business sector. And I think that is sort of key. I mean, the knowledge about the scientific and some gen being generalist, but also then in-depth experience and long-time experience and networks from the different fields. 
And I think it helps us that we have different backgrounds. My own background is in agriculture, actually. Indeed, indeed. I mean, I think one uh, one of the speakers uh, raised the, the issue of interdisciplinarity. So you know, that should also obviously apply to the to the um, to the policy analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, so sorry, can I can I just yeah. add? I think it has been useful for us, and and I want to talk to the communicators. They say the same thing. Since we have to work with marine issues, it's it's a necessity that you know something about marine issues. It's extremely difficult if you come blank with, I don't know, you being some something else. You know, you need to have that basic understanding. Otherwise, it's quite difficult. I think. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, I wanted to to turn back to the question of skills um, because uh, Gun she she introduced some important skills I find I found uh, including project management uh, and you know because the, the the communication and science and policy aspect has to be included in the project management uh, but then also obviously understanding of science and of policy processes uh, networking um listening but then you also mentioned training students which i found very interesting that this is also part of your work and sort of matching strategy to context so i, I wanted to ask maybe into the, the the whole group um whether you've so maybe if if you think any skills are missing um from this list and um which ones you would think are maybe the most critical ones from the from the ones that Green um, Green Center is is like promoting? Um, do I have anyone wanting to take this? Yaga, please. Yes, uh, thank you. So. Um... Uh, for me, what, what is sort of a challenging, I'm coming also from academia, so I'm also sort of ex-scientist, and, and then I sort of want to transition into the uh, science for policy. So stakeholder mapping is something which is extremely um, difficult in a sense that um, the diversity and the amount of organizations, let's say just in Europe, is uh, overwhelming, and also... Um, not only mapping them, but then also knowing who comes, uh, like what is the, the priority or what is the sequence, who advise whom or who is dependent on whom. Uh, so th this I found um, uh, sort of yeah, challenging to, um, uh, to, mm -hmm. to understand. Indeed, that's really I, Yeah, please. May, may I add, I, I really agree with you. I find this also really challenging because there's always a risk that somebody said this very nicely previously, that you talk to the people you already know. And that's so easy to fall into that trap. And um, I don't have, you know, you know, the, the silver bullet solution for that. But the only thing that I keep in mind is that who who am I not talking to? Who should I be talking to that I, I don't already know? And how how do I find that out? And I think that is tricky and it takes a lot of time. So I think that phase of doing your project planning is really important. As you said, Yaga, you know, mapping that, you know, who is where and what. And if anybody has any good suggestions of how to get hold of that, that you don't already know, I think that is important. And the only way I think about it is to try to approach, you know, the the maybe even the opponents who are opposing what you want, maybe talk to them and talk to their colleagues because that could learn, teach you something, of course. Yeah, um, I think, Christian, you mentioned that as part of your presentation, the um, very intriguing Joint Research uh, Center um, competency map, uh, so constant competency framework, science, science to policy for both policymakers and for researchers. And um, uh, having looked at that, I find it really intriguing. I mean, it has really every everything I think that one could possibly need. And is there perhaps an opportunity to really promote that much, much more beyond the 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 the, uh, the audiences that already know about it? Because, I mean, the, the I think this is such a panopticum of of skills and competencies that are needed at, at this interface on both sides. And um, and for example, one thing that strikes me particularly is, is systems thinking. For example, is identified. 
as, as a skill, which is often not talked about or is misunderstood or uh, and not not really fully appreciated, which, for example, also includes well who who do you need to who who is affected by by this and to, who is also who are the marginalized voices i mean there's a, a who are the stakeholders for example that are harmed by something i mean how do you reach out to this and also maybe convening systems convening and um, um how do you actually get people uh, like uh, Gun, you mentioned that you you're going to 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 across the university and knocking on on doors and i mean but, but outside of a university or a particular institution how do you get to the people how do you get their attention how do you how do you get them to answer an email uh, or i mean how do you actually convene the system bringing the whole system into into the the room for for example so i just wanted to make a plug for your wonderful competency framework from jrc because it's really worth knowing and and promoting it's it's every, everything is there and really exploring all the angles it's really worthwhile Thanks, Baba. I mean, we, we we are trying to appear modest, um, so that's why we don't show it too too aggressively. But um, I find it interesting that you picked up on systems thinking because, in a way, it relates to stakeholder mapping. You have to get an overview of who are the main actors, how do they interact, where are sort of the most sort of the central nodes in this network. Um, so that you know, given your limited resources, you actually uh, pick the right people to to engage with. Um, so that's indeed a um, key competence, also in in in, 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 the, in our view and from our work as on on sort of these science for policy ecosystems. And that was also, I think, um, it was also mentioned that this sort of we have to get away maybe even for knowledge brokers. Um, from this bi binary framing that you that you have sort of the science community, the uh, policy making community, and then you have the bridge builders, um, and to think much more in sort of integrated um, ways, which which may in turn again require specific skills like collaboration for one. You know, whatever comes with it, like uh, organizing certain types of events. Um, that are highly interactive. Uh, um, I don't know, but but you know there there are sort of um, there's a lot of, of um, thinking still to be done on how on which skills to single out for for knowledge brokerage. Um, but anyway, I, I'm not supposed to talk too much. So um, would anyone else like to to take the floor and maybe identify it, it, one of the top top skill, the most important skills you you think. You are either applying, or you wish you had developed, or I don't know. Uh, please, 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 um, uh, raise your hand. And um, yes, uh, yeah, please, Mary. Um, uh, Maura, don't worry about it. Um, uh, okay. One of the things I think really stands out to me is how, and and again, I think the Irish policy cycle is really fast compared to the EU policy cycle. So policymakers, I find. In Ireland, I really like. I need it now, and don't show me a paper, and don't tell me. So they view what is produced in in research as inaccessible. So there's no point in telling them about open access. They're not interested. <laughs> um, um, and so, and also, I I find there's often a mismatch between what drives. I mean, I'm like again, this might might be very coloured by the Irish system, but what drives. Uh, the role of universities and the role of academics and their promotion and career progression is publications of new discoveries and novel. So research is about novelty, but good policy isn't always about novelty. Sometimes it's about what, well, it's about what works. So what works best, not necessarily the newest thing. So um, I think it, it's, Sometimes I think there's such a, a mismatch, both in terms of the, those, you know, I know you have writing for policymakers there, and that might seem quite simple to write a policy brief, and maybe it is, but it is distilling, it's more thinking about the other, like what their need is, and the timings, like the timings are horrendous, like how how do you, you know, explain what research is to people who are like, I need it now, and you're like, well, I can give it to you in five years, um, and, and even then, even then, I might say mm, a bit of this, bit of that, maybe not 100 percent sure. So that's quite hard for them to understand. And so I think there's there's definitely a skill. And, you know, I think it's more than just writing for policymakers. I, I suspect 
that there's probably a bit of this secondments and a bit of this living in the space of the people who are trying to make the policies you could so you can deeply understand how inaccessible um or unhelpful most academic publications are to policymakers. So I yeah, I'd love to see I'd love to see more opportunities for that. We we have an, a new programme in Ireland. It's got a couple of years old run by SFI about kind of people allowing people to do fellowships into into departments, you know, which I think has been really illuminating. But that is the first program in Ireland of its type. And I know that the system in the EU is much more advanced overall, but in our national policy framework, it's it's a real I mean, it's a just a real struggle, you know. I see yeah, good. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. And thanks a lot for bringing this up because I think you, I mean, it's on the spot. I think what I find myself when I work with people it's that total sort of lack of understanding from both sides because scientists can't really understand the everyday work from the policymaker nor the other way around. So okay. I think, I, you know, we sometimes really try to organize quite informal meetings and really going to policymakers and saying, you know, with, together with scientists, what, what do you want from science? science you know how can we help you and really trying to do that from that long-term perspective because as you say it takes a lot of time to you know compile and synthesize research in a, in a manner that's suitable and sometimes when you ask uh, I mean the policymaker might say okay I have this issue and I want to know if I should go this way or this way and then you take that to the to the researchers and they say yeah of course it's this way you know in, in their decision and then we say okay let's say that ah, oh, the researcher goes, it might be there or there or a little bit like that. And we said, no, you have to understand, this is the issue of going that way or that way. Please feel comfortable in that sort of pointing in a direction at least. So I think by having that really open and fruitful discussions on both sides, that helps you. But that, that again brings you back to being there, talking to people, and as you say, being really close to both sides. Thanks indeed. Um, I'm just seeing that there were a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Sorry, I didn't follow the chat at all. Um, with some very concrete examples. Oh, is this is this a different um, chat? And also, I think Gloria is is waving. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Let's go to yeah. Let's go to to her then, uh, please, Gloria. Sorry. I uh, I might might be a bit biased because it's like, uh, I don't find my words. I find the way of communicating through visuals. But I think it's something that we should consider because it's like, we say science is a uh, universal language, but it's not. It's like, you have many people who are scientists working in different fields and they really don't understand each other. And for example, a way that I try to bring this on the table is like, can we have people who are trained in creating visuals, not always like amazing illustrations, but on the power of storytelling, of eliminating details, but still keeping the key message there. And I think this is also a way that you can knock on people and try to bring them together to complete the picture. If you talk the visual language rather than just saying science, science is full of jargon and every discipline has different jargon that we don't understand, but it's like, I think these knowledge brokers, I love the word, the term, should be also trying to kind of bring all these things together in a visual language, eliminating details, but keeping the message and then engaging more and more people to keep completing this picture. Because then it's like, you have already something that you can give to these policymakers who is much easier to understand because it's like, it's a mixture of all the languages that the different science departments talk. So I think it's something, I mean, it doesn't have to be like, you don't need to be a proper illustrator. You don't need to be a, a, like a, an artist, but you should be able to know all these tools that these people use, like storytelling, layout, removing them, too much detail and just keeping things simple, but still accurate within the science. Thanks, Dr. Gloria. Indeed, this, this is very important uh, and also, in fact, part of the training of the JRC that gives, we give to the, to the scientists, the visual communication, etc. 
Uh, Juliana, um, and then we have to close very soon. Juliana, over to you. Hi there. So I'm actually um, in Brussels at the venue and I'm jumping between sessions. So I'm happy to be able to follow along. Um, and I posted some questions in the Q&A, but I'm afraid we might not get to them. But actually, I wanted to flip it to you, Christian, because um, in my in my work, I participate in EU research funded projects. Um, so we're work package leaders and we try to bridge um, the divide between scientific research and how to translate that into policy development and reform. Um, so I want to flip it to you and ask what have you come across that you find is effective when we try to communicate and when we try to translate scientific findings? Like what, and by that I mean, um, you know, tools or packaging or strategies. What, what have you found on your end? Because you represent um, a, pl a key player in this equation. So what have you found effective? And maybe that also helps in terms of identifying some of those skills. And like every, all of the other colleagues today mentioned, we have very different profiles and bring different capacities and skills to the table. So I think a lot of focus is on what are our capacities? What, what are we lacking? Where can we improve? But I think it would be interesting to hear from you what you find helpful. Um, what are some tips? You know, how can we approach you in, in more effective or strategic or fruitful ways? It's, I mean, it is, it is a bit hard for me to, to respond because uh, since the JRC is the science and, and, and knowledge service of the commission, we are more on, on the science supply side. But I mean, what I found out, found to be working from when I talk to the colleagues that with the hard science in our institution is that it is indeed, okay, you, you, you produce a report, but the report itself doesn't, doesn't help at all. I mean, you know, no one's gonna read it. Uh, well, they may, but first we have to talk to people. So it's about uh, establishing longer term working relations uh, at different levels uh, with the policy officers, with the management, if you can. Um, um, and then if you have frequent meetings, you can actually place um, your own research much more effectively than, than if, if you don't have this existing relationship. So the key skill is ultimately that you know the stakeholder mapping ultimately, the policy system, understanding the policy system, and then to build uh, relations, which then in turn raises questions of inclusivity that were raised earlier. So who, who, who actually has the resources to build these uh, long-term relations? So I think Wyn's um, institution gives a lot of support to the policy team. So you know you, you have you're in a good position. The JRC is in a fantastic position, being part of the European Commission. So we have easy access to the policy DGs, to the colleagues. But for people working in academic institutions outside, um, with limited resources and support by the universities, it's much harder to develop such relations. Um, so ideally, my call to everyone working at universities with any power. Um, please sort of build capacity or convince your senior management to build capacity for better policy engagement. And based on that, things will hopefully improve and uh, will be easier for you to, to shape policies. Okay, it is five o'clock. Uh, it was most interesting. Uh, thank you for, for joining us.